What do you think about L. Ron Hubbard? Fascinating. One of the most fascinating human beings I've ever read about, and I, I, I'm like really big on biographies. I love reading about people, historical figures. Um, fascinating guy. I think that he was a tortured soul. I think that he was simultaneously a sinner and a saint, you know what I mean? And simultaneously, I, I definitely don't think Hubbard was all bad. Definitely not, I think, because I, I actually spent some time with Ken Urquhart, who was Hubbard's kind of top lieutenant, who lives in Western Mass, old British guy. I spent some time with him, and very, very, very sane, rational, intelligent guy who told me a lot of personal stories about how Hubbard treated him and treated different people. And it's the same thing. It's like he could be the most loving, charming, wonderful person. He could be absolutely horrible, scary, you know? So I think he was... Um, like most very successful people, extremely complex, um, not extremely um, volatile, very, very intelligent, obviously, do what he did, very extremely creative. One of the things I like about Hubbard the most, he was very creative. You know, he was an amazing mind in terms of his writing, in terms of, you know, just inventing Scientology off the cuff the way he did, um, his photography. I mean, he did a lot of other things, too, that I think was really interesting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my, my opinion on, on, on Hubbard is he's an interesting guy. Good guy or bad guy? Don't know. Very interesting, very captivating, very, very, very American. L. Ron Hubbard is very American. You know what I mean? Scientology is a very American religion. It came from the West, from, from like, you know, you think about Hubbard. He grew up in Montana. You know what I mean? He grew up in, in like, as the West was kind of dying. You know what I mean? So I think a lot of the, the, the lectures and a lot of the ideology of Scientology of kind of like fighting back and like being like this pioneer and a lot of those things came from his own psychology of growing up in, in kind of like a very kind of dangerous and kind of barren land um, and represented by the spirit that was kind of imbued in the American West at that time as it was dying out, you know what I mean? As it was being kind of in, in, industry was going there and all these different things. So I think you can see a lot of that in the philosophy of Scientology as being like a phenomenon of like some kind of American Western ideology. It's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, you might be stretching with that, but I, I think you can definitely find a lot of correlations between this, the system he developed and kind of how he grew up and, and his own upbringing and his own... I mean, he, I mean, you think about his life, it's just so amazing. I mean, you know, traveling through Asia and all these different things. It's really... And, and obviously, I know that he embellished a lot of the things, but even if he didn't embellish it, it's still pretty amazing. I mean, I think the real story is just as good as the embellished story, and that's the thing that people don't... And, and that's the real sad thing, you know what I mean? That even if you have to, even if he lied about some stuff, his life in and of itself was amazing. To me, Hubbard was a deeply flawed man. Deeply, yeah. But but we all are though. I'm. I mean, I'm deeply flawed. And I, I think being a human being, you are, you have to be flawed to be a human being. And that's the simultaneous beauty and, and terror of, of living. You know what I mean? What's remarkable to me though is. This deeply flawed man yeah. said that he had the answers to make you this superior person yeah. without flaws. Yeah. And yet it couldn't help him. Yeah. Well, I think it, it did help him in some ways. I, I, I think that, I, I think that, see, this is the thing about auditing, is that it's like, it's very like this. You know what I mean? You have this incredible experience where all of a sudden you're up in the clouds and you're writing poetry and you're kind of like, whoa, you know what I mean? Like you see the beauty in life and then a, a, a month later you're like crashing, you know what I mean? So I think Hubbard definitely had those experiences when he was getting out of it or, or, or doing something within Scientology and would have these beautiful kind of awakenings to different parts of, of, of himself or his psychology that he could, that he could create better. And, and I, I think, I, I truly think that in those moments what he was saying was authentic. And then comes the downside, right? The dark side, the, the, the hangover, you know what I mean? From the spiritual awakening. And a lot of those things that he thought about or talked about didn't have the same effect. So I, I also think, though, that like a lot of flawed people try to do things. I mean, I, I think that's why most people that do amazing things are, are very, very flawed. Because they are so flawed internally that they have to project it externally and rise above it. I mean, if, when, when you read the history, there's a great book called The Intellectuals by Paul Johnson. And it gives kind of a biography of these of um, Rousseau, Sartre, um, Marx, um, Hemingway, you know, like 10 different people. I mean, you talk about flawed. I mean, you talk about crazy. I mean, all these people had these incredible personal problems, yet at the same time they could do, they could write and think and create these amazing, 
beautiful works. So for me, most people in life who do great things are really, really messed up. So I mean, it doesn't surprise me at all that Hubbard was messed up. And I think, and this is the thing about Scientology that to me is like so heartbreaking, is that like they, they distance themselves from the messed upness that we all are. Like a Scientologist will never admit that they have any problems. They'll never admit that they have like an emotional weakness or, or some kind of, it, it, to them it's like wrong to admit any type of weakness. And I think that's where, you're, that's where people's fundamental strength comes from by realizing how weak we are, but also how strong we are at the same time. And I think that interplay of weakness and strength is what makes artists and what makes leaders and what makes writers and what makes anyone who does things in the world good. That's what makes them good is that interplay of weakness and strength that's projected out into the, into the field. And I, I think it's horrible that Scientologists can't see that. And not only that, they don't want anything to do with it. They, they, just, want the, they just want the good, you know what I mean? And, and, and it's a false good. It's a, are, it's a fake good. There are a lot of promises made yeah. as you're going up the bridge. Totally, yeah. A lot of promises that are totally divorced from reality. And again, we, you know, and if, if this was totally Hubbard's responsibility, then shame on him. But, who, I mean, you know, for me, it's like, I don't know how the whole thing evolved, and I don't know how the whole thing was structured and, and how it became that way. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. You know what I mean? I mean, they're, they're basically selling God. I mean... They're basically selling indulgences. You know, they're, they're doing something very similar what, what the Catholic Church did prior to Luther. You know what I mean? And they're selling freedom. They're selling forgiveness. They're selling things that have to do with, with, with the inner life, with the spiritual life. And that is just so wrong. And it's so sick. And it's so sad. It, it's, it's sad. You know what I mean? One of the reasons why I'm speaking out and one of the reasons why I've offered myself for different interviews is because I don't, want what, I don't want what happened to me to ever happen to anybody again. And there's no reason why it should be because people can look in my eyes and see if I'm an honest person or not and see if what I'm saying in this interview or other interviews just by my tone of voice and my inflection and, and what I'm saying, if it's true or not. You know, I know what I'm saying is 100% factual. It's my experience. I lived it, but I also objectively saw it. So I, I, I have this, a lot of people who, can, who criticize Scientology has never been here and actually been through it, you know what I mean? So I've seen it, I've read about it, but I've lived it too. I've actually been in the room when there's 10 people trying to get money from you. I've been in the, the Ells hallway at the Fort Harrison Hotel and, and did my Ells. So I think I'm speaking from a place of, of experience and, and speaking from a place of authenticity. Um, I would never, ever, ever in a million years wish what I experienced in anybody, my worst enemy, or anyone even remotely close to that. Um, I think it's, um, I think what happened to me um, definitely made me stronger as a human being, and it made me stronger by like totally crushing me and totally, yeah, killing me. You know what I mean? Like, when I left Scientology in February of 2010, I mean, I, I felt, yeah, I felt suicidal. I felt like I didn't, I felt so destroyed as a human being, and I felt so betrayed by people who supposedly I trusted that it's really hard to actually verbalize the feeling that I had. And it's, it's, it's like this feeling of helplessness. It's a feeling of total alienation. It's a feeling of um, not being able to communicate. Like, you know, I can remember my mom saying to me, like, what's wrong? And, I, and it's just like you can't, you can't even begin to express and relate the type of experience I went through because it would be so over her head that she couldn't even possibly. I mean, yeah, I'm not saying she hasn't been through her things, but like the level of the betrayal by a religious organization that I experienced, for me, it was really hard to believe that other people could experience that. But then the more you talk about it, you realize people do experience different things like this, you know? It's interesting, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I really like when I was kind of reading about people who have been through similar experiences, whether it's Scientology or the thing, one of the things that I, I really identified a lot was with people like abuse victims. You know what I mean? I really identified with that experience of being like, like totally helpless and, and betrayed and, and all these things because I really felt like, you know, they basically took all this money from me and then just kicked me off the side of the road and had no caring for me at all as like a human being. Like I was an object to them. I, I, I had become objectified and my money had become objectified and my soul had become objectified. You know what I mean? And I think that was... Yeah, really hard. 
I, I heard a great line one time. It says, a thief wants, a thief says to you, give me your money or your life. Scientology says to you, give me your money and your life. And I always, I always identify with that. How did you pull yourself out of that depression after you left? Um, I was in it for a long time, man. You know, I, I, I was pretty much unable to work. I was unable to, um, unable to really physically move, you know, because that's something that's really important to me, um, is movement of the body. I'd been a professional athlete and, you know, studied yoga for a long time. So I was, I was unable to move. I was unable to, um, you know, interact with, like, old friends. I felt like, like, the scarring I had gone through, like, it was just like, wow, like, I'm, like, a totally different person now. And, like, I feel like I can't even talk to these people that I had, that I had been with. But I think it's just a process. Like, I just... I just kind of was just in it for a while. I mean, really, I didn't do anything. I just was kind of depressed for a while, you know? Um, and then, you know, I, I think even now, you know, a couple of years later, I mean, yeah, I definitely have days now, you know what I mean, where, where that experience definitely still affects me. I mean, you know, I'm still trying to get my money back from these people, you know, still to this day. So, I mean, that, that definitely affects me because in, in some way I'm still connected to these guys, you know what I mean? And I want nothing to do with them. You know, I want to be as far away from... Scientology as possible, you know? How much money did you spend in Scientology? $350,000 in one year. I donated. Yeah, and that's, um, that is not just auditing. That's, you know, human rights campaigns and all this money that I donated to the cause, you know what I mean, in addition to actually paying for auditing. Hubbard says really, really clearly that if you leave the organization within 90 days and demand money back, you have to get paid back. Now, I demanded it the day I left, you know what I mean? I knew that this whole thing was a total, like, I was like, I've been, like, I'm done, you know what I mean? And I went to the point, Mark, when I said, listen, you know something? You don't have to give me all my money back. Just be, just be fair, give me something that's reasonable and whatever, I don't even care. Even though I wanted all my money back and I felt like I deserved all my money back and I felt like I deserved my money back and then some for what they did to me, I was just like, listen, just, just give me a fair settlement and I'll just, whatever, you know? And they offered me like $25,000 or something like that. You know what I mean? So I felt like so insulted and so, I mean, not only that, they're just blatantly disregarding the words of their own guy that founded the religion. So I've been actively trying to, um, yeah, get back this money for, for a while now, you know? And, and it's like every time it's like the new thing, they refuse to communicate with me. They refuse to have any type of honest discourse with me. And it's, it's really interesting. One of the first people I talked to when I left was a chaplain at Flag. Paul Greenwood was his name. And he said to me, he's like, Brian, you should get every penny back. You should get every penny back, and I'm going to write a, write a report saying that you should get all your money back. And the next time I called him two weeks later, he hung up the phone on me. He wouldn't talk to me anymore. Apparently, he probably said, give him his money back, and they said, don't say that again. You know? Now that you've been speaking out, have you felt repercussions from Scientology? No. Nope. I haven't felt anything. And to be honest with you, I have absolutely no fear of any repercussions. I could care less if they do anything to me. What I'm, I, have, I have absolutely no fear of the Church of Scientology. And I think that's another reason why I want people to know there's nothing to be afraid of. Even if they do something, it's not going to do anything to you. You know what I mean? And I, I feel like if they act out against me, it just makes them look totally ridiculous. I look totally foolish. You know what I mean? I have done nothing wrong to Scientology. Nothing. I was involved in this organization for, for a year. I respected them. I went by all their rules. They, fit, they f misrepresented and broke every single promise they made to me. And all I said was, I didn't even ask for all my money back. I said, just give me something back that's fair. And I never want to talk to you again, never see you again. I don't want to speak badly about you in public. I don't want to do anything. I want to, I want to live my life. And they couldn't do that. So, I mean, my, my, me speaking to you today is a result of them not being honest, period. I'm just calling them on the carpet for what they've done to me and them breaking the fundamental principles of what Hubbard says to do. You know what I mean? It's like if Hubbard says if people are, are happy with services, you pay them back immediately. And they, they have totally disrespected and disregarded that. Scientology tries to criminalize whistleblowing. You know, they try to make the act of whistleblowing wrong 
And you know, we live in a world today that is becoming integrated and corporatized and all these different things are happening where whistleblowing is so important. It's so essential, not just in Scientology, but on a government level, on a social level, on a corporate level. So whistleblowers are people who are seeing things that are happening that are wrong, that have to make people aware of what's happening. And that is such an important act. And for Scientology as a religion to have the audacity to make that wrong and make criminalizing and criminalize the act of whistleblowing is so repulsive and reprehensible, I can't even begin to put into words. Because whistleblowing is what we as a society need. We need more on all, not just Scientology, but all different sectors of life. And I think people who have the courage, whether it's Scientology or in a government or anywhere, to stand up and say, hey, the power in this organization, what you're doing is wrong, it's a very, it's a very, it's an act of heroism and an act that should be applauded and supported, not destroyed and disparaged.